Dwayne. You got to say on <laughs> tall people. Hey, Amen. Good morning, everybody. We have a guest speaker this morning. I'm it. <laughs> um, Richie and Elizabeth are uh, out of town. Uh, James and Jennifer are with them. Uh, they're in Florida, in Orlando, for a campus retreat. And all the campus kids are with them. And, but you know I'm excited because it's still pretty enthusiastic in here this morning, even though all the kids are gone. Uh, I was kind of concerned that uh, it would be flatlining. Uh, but uh, I'm super encouraged. It wasn't that funny, Herbert. <laughs> Amen. Uh, but it's been a, you know, uh, it's a privilege for me to uh, get up here before you guys. And Richie asked me to do it last week. Uh, and he's been directing me as the week has gone through. Uh, the days on what to do and, and uh, just different direction, which has been awesome. And you know, Richie always has this story at the beginning. Uh, most, a lot of the guys do, and you know, I don't have a story today. So, you know, I don't get paid to do this, so I didn't spend a lot of time coming up with a story. So can you live without the story? Amen. So the title of my lesson is, Turn Your Hearts Back to God. Um, you know that song we sang, Trials Dark on Every Hand? Trials Dark on Every Hand, and we can't understand all the ways that God would lead us to this blessed promised land. But he'll guide us with his eye and we'll follow till we die. And then we'll understand it better by and by. Um, you know, we're often destitute, temptations, life can be a challenge. So where do you put your confidence? Where does your confidence lie? The government? Whoa, baby. Obama? Donald Trump? Hillary? Wow, that's quite a field right there. How about uh, your family? Do you put your uh, confidence in your family? You married, how about do you put your confidence in your spouse? How's your job situation? You got a lot of confidence there? Um, 401ks? Money? No confidence going on there? How about in yourself? You know we're all selfish. We all put a lot of confidence in ourselves. But do you know where we put, need to put it? We need to put our confidence in the Lord. Amen? So I want to start out in Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17. In verse 7. Jeremiah 17. I got this little light up here that Tawny hooked up for me so I can see. It says in verse 7, But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Do you believe in God's sovereignty? Uh, sovereignty, how about in the details of your life? You know, we can trust God. If you look out today when you're driving in, there's a lot of color going on. Spring is here. The tulips are out. The daffodils are out. The roses are coming. The, uh, the azaleas. Um, God displays his work everywhere. And we can trust it. Honestly, we can because he is trustworthy. He created you, he created me. Uh, just our reproductive system in itself is, a, is an amazing thing. But he promises our blessings here. And we won't fear when he comes if we put our confidence in him. Amen. And you won't have any worries. How's your worry get this morning? Any of you worried? No. None of you? No. About your income tax or um, if you're getting any or you have to pay? It also says we'll bear much fruit if we trust in God. Do you believe that? No. In a year of drought, this may be a year of drought for you, but do you still believe it? It can be challenging when you go through hard times. 
So why do we fail to put our confidence in God? Look up in verse 5 and 6. In verse 5 it says, this is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who depends on flesh for his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. He will be like a bush in the wasteland. He will not see prosperity when it comes. He will dwell in parched places of the desert and in a salt land where no one lives. You know, it's, it's a challenge to put our confidence in God. And I think we fail. I know I have many times. Um, we put it somewhere else. I mean, multiple things. Um, and curses come when we don't put our trust in God. Um, and I think even when we, we are prospered, we don't necessarily see it yeah. or aware of it. Uh, the way God blesses us and takes care of us. It's, uh, you know, when we, when we turn our hearts away from God, I think we get blinded. The veil kind of covers our eyes and we don't see. And we end up in parched places. Uh, lonely, isolated in our hearts. You know, but God wants to bless us. But sometimes we're unable to see it or appreciate his blessings. Sometimes his blessings are wasted on us. I don't know if you ever felt like that. But what causes you? Or what causes all of us to turn our hearts from God? There's a lot of things that can cause it. I think family, uh, marital problems, relationship problems, even relationship problems in the church. Church conflicts, confusion, financial problems, your health. Yeah. If you have attitudes towards me, anybody got an attitude towards me? <laughs> or Richie, or the wives, um, or with each other. If you have attitudes, you know, Matthew 18 says you need to go to that person Amen. and talk to them and get resolution. If you don't do that, if you have issues, your hearts are far from God. And the only way you can have a clear heart is if you be able and willing to talk to the people that, have, uh, that you have a problem with. Does that make sense? And I mean, it's, it's for you. It's not for the other person. If you have attitudes or issues, you need to go to that person so you can have a clear heart and a conscience before God. Because otherwise, that's a parched place. That's not where you want to camp out. Because you'll get bitter and you'll leave God. And you may not leave the fellowship, but in your heart of hearts, you will leave. Um, you know, in, in, uh, in John 16, verse 33, you don't have to turn there. Jesus said, there will be trouble in this life. He says, take heart, I've overcome, but you will have trouble. Anybody in trouble right now? I mean, there's trouble every day in my life. Um, sometimes it's small, sometimes it's big, but there's always trouble. Why, did, why? why does God allow trouble? You know, as Christians, we think, oh, it's going to be awesome. No more trouble. We're going to get money. <laughs> we'll be wealthy. Uh, uh, How's that working for you? You know, um, God allows things to happen for a reason. Turn over to First Peter chapter one. Yeah, I don't. I think Matthew and Braxton and Samira, three people that just recently got baptized. I think they're with the campus group in uh, in Florida. In 1 Peter, chapter 1, I was thinking about them when I thought about this scripture, because they've experienced birth into a living hope. In 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 3, this praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. On verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. 
You know, those three people got baptized in the last few weeks. And I know they've had some trials. Even though they've been forgiven of their sins, they've, you know, experienced a new birth. But why have they come? These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine. And may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So they rejoice. We can all rejoice as disciples, as Christians. But in verse 6 it says we're going to suffer. And none of us like to suffer. But why do we suffer? Joe, why do we suffer? Joe and I have had this conversation a lot. So that your faith may be proved genuine. So that your faith may be proved genuine. And I know just about everybody in here. Not well. I've had some conversations with just about all of you. And I know you've gone through trials. But God allowed them to happen. So that your faith can be proved genuine. So what should your attitude be when you go through these trials? What's your attitude? Turn over to James. Just back up in the, the, the book right behind it. In James chapter 1. James 1 verse 2. What should your attitude be? In verse 2 of James 1, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. So the call is to persevere through them. Why? So that you can be mature. That's a hard teaching. So what that means is, if you're not going through it, coming out on the other side, you're not mature. So you feeling mature this morning? Or are you grumbling and complaining about your trials? Or your suffering? Or your struggles? Consider it pure joy when you go through them. You know, I'm 68 years old and I've had a lot of trials. Um, and you think you have them at 20 or 30? Uh, you wait till you get older. All kind of trials come, whether it's family, finances, uh, relationships. I mean, they come, and they don't stop. They will keep coming. My attitude is like, okay, that one's done. What's the next one going to be? And is it going to be harder than this one? <laughs> but it's not going to stop because God's going to keep working on you to refine you. It's hard. It's a challenge to be refined. So that you can be pure and complete, not lacking anything. Not lacking anything. So if you're not mature, then you're lacking something in your character. You know, in my life, I have a lot of confidence in certain things. I can be pretty self-reliant. Um, most of my life, I was in the automobile business. And I worked on multiple kinds of cars. But I did a lot of restoration on automobiles in the 40s, 50s, no, not, my, not then, but those years of the car. <laughs> Let's clear that. <laughs> 1940s automobiles, 50s, 60s, 70s. I've restored a lot of Mercedes-Benz, Porsches, um, uh, old trucks, muscle cars, Chevelles, Mustangs. I've, I've restored a lot of them. And I'm pretty much a perfectionist when it comes to those things. Uh, it drives Jeannie crazy. Uh, I did a lot of work on yachts when I was young, and everything was wood, and they were flawless. So I have an eye for detail. Even in homes, I, I look at homes, I go, who built this thing, man? Because <laughs> there's flaws everywhere. Um, but I've, I've got a real critical eye with those kind of things. And I'm very confident. Uh, people used to spend sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars to restore their car. It's like whew, people are crazy, but they liked it. They were in love affair with their automobiles. But do you know where I'm not confident? Standing up here before you. This is super challenging for me. I have no confidence in public speaking. I never had any training. Um, unschooled and ordinary, uh, like the guys in Acts two. 
But, you know, God keeps putting me up here. You guys see me up here almost every week. I'm going, what the? I don't get it. <laughs> but they keep putting me up here. My first prayer, we used to do a closing prayer at the end of the service. My first closing prayer, thank you, God, for the service. In Jesus' name, amen. I ran off the stage. <laughs> like, whew, I was sweating. My heart was pumping. You know, I asked a brother this morning to do the opening prayer. He was like, ugh. I don't know. Uh, I said, bro, it's okay. If you don't want to do it, it's okay. I get it. I don't want to get up here either. But, but God keeps putting me up here. You know, it takes a lot of wrestling and prayer for me to be up here. And a lot of practice. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I've preached to the walls this week, this sermon. So that I could get up here and do it and be confident. Me and the wall. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit, of course. Any of you relate to that? Yes. Next time I ask you to come up here, you better be ready. <laughs> Amen. You know, not long ago, back in, well, a long time ago, 15 years ago, I turned my heart away from God. I went to the desert. Uh, we had problems, Gene and I had problems in our family. Um, two, my two sons went, uh, they went into their teen years and uh, they became different men. I, I didn't recognize them. And they gave us a run for our money, to say the least. And there was problems in the church that we were a part of for 25 years. Uh, I felt in the desert. I felt like I was cursed. Um, it was a very difficult time for both of us. Um, and I felt like I wasn't getting blessed by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and I, I'm not going to go into it all. We, uh, in the 90s, we, had, we lost all four of our parents. We um, just one right after another. I lost a business partner in a boating accident. Um, one of Jeannie's youngest brother um, took his own life uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, and then my boys went south. They went crazy. Uh, got into all kind of trouble and it was a very very challenging time and I felt like giving up and I didn't leave the church but I left God in my heart yeah. in my heart of hearts I came I was the last one in the door and I was the first one out but I was here but my heart wasn't here and it wasn't here we were still in Florida at the time um, but it was super challenging. And I know people, I know you guys, some of you are going through stuff right now. Yeah. You're going through hard times with your families, spouses, kids, jobs, money, all the things that I've mentioned that can pull your heart away from God if you let it. And, you know, I, I look back and I wonder, why did I let it happen? Why didn't I turn and stay faithful? I got hard. I just got hard and hearted. And I pulled my heart back. And you know, we can do that on any given day. We can pull our heart away from God on any given day because of these kind of trials. If you don't fight, you can go through the motions, but you know, everybody knows where you're at. All you gotta do is look at your face and the way you carry yourself. Or you could might fake us out for a while, but you fake yourself out. You're not really ringing true to God, first and foremost, and to yourself. And the only person you hurt is you. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it can be very, very hurtful uh, if you're not really close to the Lord. You know, it took a radical effort at that time for me to turn around and to turn back to God. Um, first, I had to recognize where I was at, which I didn't really want to look, even though I knew. Uh, I'd started drinking again. I had been uh, smoking cigars and you know, just all those stupid outward things but it was an indicator of where my heart was at. Um, but I had to be desperate to change. You know, do you feel desperate today in any way? It takes some desperation. And I had to act on it. it had to be some repentance, a lot of repentance. Um, you know, 
About 30 years ago, I restored a guy to, to God, and I, I baptized another guy, and we became best friends. Um, I restored Matt, and I baptized this guy named Don. This is back in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And Don was certified as a scuba diver. Matt and I, we weren't certified. But we chose to go anyway. And I'd done a lot of snorkeling. I lived on the beach. I grew up on the beach uh, in, in Fort Lauderdale, in Miami area. And I'm a good swimmer. But we rented a bunch of equipment. You ever rent something? You ever rent a car or uh, a truck from Home Depot or, you know, anything that you rent? It's been used by other people. It's not always in the best of condition. But we decided to go, and we did a beach dive, which is good on a calm day, but not like a day like today. And it was, it was a windy day. The surf was about three feet. But, you know, we were young, in our 30s, and dumb. <laughs> but we just, we just decided to do it anyway. And we are there, we rented the equipment, so we knew better. But we went after it. We went for glory. You know, you got the mask, you got the tank, you got the weight belt, flippers. I had the flag so the boats didn't run over us. So I was dragging the flag and we're going out and we're, everything's going pretty good and they're in front of me and I'm kind of in the rear. And we get out to the first reef, which is a pretty good ways out on the Fort Lauderdale Beach. And they went down and my tank started to have problems. And then the mouthpiece, anybody scuba diving here? Anybody ever been out? Well, you have two tips on the mouthpiece. One of them broke off. And so I couldn't keep it in my mouth. It kept coming out of my mouth. And so I'm drinking salt water. It was not a good picture. They were already down, checking out the reef, and I had a panic attack. Not good when you're out in the ocean by yourself. I tried to drop everything. I didn't care if I rented it. I didn't care what it cost. I just wanted to get rid of that stuff. The only thing I was able to get rid of was the mask. I couldn't get the weight belt off because I was, my, in my panic, I lost my thinking, my rationale. I knew where the weight belt was, but I couldn't get it off. And I couldn't get that stinking tank off. And there's a vest that you can actually blow up. I wasn't certified, I didn't know how to do it. <laughs> like, okay, it'd, it'd be good to have lessons for this. But I am a good swimmer, and I swam to shore. Thank goodness for the fins they, and my legs and my ability. I made it back to shore. I've never prayed before or since like that day, <laughs> ever. It was a prayer of desperation for my life. I wish I could pray like, well, I should pray like that every day. That's my choice. You know, I got to the beach, and I couldn't stand up. I was exhausted. It was a pretty good swim. And so I got all this equipment on. I'm laying on the side. The tank's still there. And what you call the soup is all the white water. It was just slopping me around, and I couldn't, I couldn't get up. My legs were just shaking. And people would come by. I looked like a fool. I looked like a fool. I'm laying in the soup. <laughs> and one lady's getting by, did you get anything? I go, Do I, is there anything in my basket? <laughs> I almost died late. I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, I got something. I saved my life. It's funny now. It wasn't funny that day. <laughs> it took everything I had to get to shore. And when I had to choose to come back to God, it took everything I had. Everything. Everything. In Luke 14, it says, give up everything to be my disciple. 